So Steve, I wanted to ask you who's on first. Absolutely. <laughs> Are you on first? <laughs> Why wouldn't he be? Or what's on second? <laughs> Maybe that's more uh, important. No, what's what's the uh, what's on second? Uh, who's on first? Okay, so yes, so <laughs> so that's uh, that's a routine that I almost know by heart. Unfortunately, it just shows it just shows that all the important information that's in my head has been squeezed out by by knowing all these obscure other things. That is an a, an incredibly complicated skit. Oh my god. <laughs> um, I think it's I don't know who's on third, right? Yeah. No, well, yeah, I don't know who's on third. But I think um, you're going to be on first, and we'll probably just go ahead now. I think we've... Okay. Uh, we, we have a bunch of people. Yeah. So um, before we talk about uh, your books, The Hidden Tools of Comedy and the Serious... Oh, 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 oh. Yes. <laughs> And the comedy hero's journey. Tell us why you dedicated your life to studying and teaching people how to be comedy writers. Because um, I'm assuming you're the class clown. Why didn't you become? I, I, I attempted to be the class clown. <laughs> that was that was only a an attempt, and it was it was through my ninety percent failure at making the class laugh, and the ten percent <laughs> of the time that they did laugh that made me want to um, know more about comedy, how it worked, why it worked, and what was happening when it wasn't working, which is what my, I guess my whole career has been about. So how did you go about doing that? Because it's not something that people really think about, oh, I think I'll teach comedy. Well, uh, it, you know, it, it actually uh, started because, um, I was always fascinated with comedy. Uh, comic actors were always my heroes. Uh, I have an embarrassing memory of uh, being at a, a school dance, I think, or, or I think it might've been a dance at my local you know, Jewish congregation. And, um, and uh, people were going up to the band and asking for requests. And I went up and I, I literally asked them, can you play Thanks for the Memory? Because that, that was Bob Hope's signature song. And they looked at me like I was very strange because I was. Um, so but so when, when I became older and uh, I became a mediocre actor and a better director, uh, a couple of friends who were actors wanted to start a theater company in New York. And we started, we started this thing we called Manhattan Punchline. And a lot of great people came out of Manhattan Punchline, like uh, David Crane, who went on to do Friends, um, a bunch of, you know, a number of people, uh, Steve Scrovan and Ellen Sandler, who became executive producers of Everybody Loves Raymond and Nathan Lane, um, Rita Rudner. Uh, so a lot of great, Peter Tolan, a lot of great people came out of Punchline. And it was a theater. Uh, I pitched this theater to these two actor friends and they, they bought it, uh, a theater completely devoted to comedy, um, you know, serious comedy. So we did plays, we had, we had stand-up nights um, uh, where Nathan Lane uh, debuted. We had uh, uh, an improv group that Michael Patrick King was the uh, lead of, and he went on to do Sex in the City. Uh, so I was doing all this comedy and uh, I was there every, you know, because it was an off-off-Broadway theater and we didn't have a lot of money. I was there every night and um, I would always, you know, I would be, t you know, taking the tickets and, and running the elevator. We were in this uh, <laughs> building where the elevator had to be manually run, like we were in the 30s. And so I saw every performance and I would watch from the back of the house and there were some performances where the actors were not getting any laughs and they would come off the stage and they would say, boy, what a terrible audience. <laughs> but what I noticed was that they were doing something different. I wasn't quite sure what, but I knew that they were doing something. They were approaching the material. They were approaching the play a little bit differently. And it wasn't that the audience was terrible because I was in the audience and I might not have laughed at the jokes because I had heard them 20 times before, but I was willing to be amused, 
but something was different and it became a, a multi-year quest to try to figure out what was happening. Why was something funny on a Thursday no longer funny on a Sunday? Um, so this began as, as, a, as a class for actors who we called it a, um, uh, a master class approach to comedy. It was a 40 week master class uh, in comedy where a lot of the principles that I have in the first book, Hidden Tools of Comedy comes from. Uh, and then when I came to Los Angeles um, and I realized that the attention span of people in Los Angeles is slightly less than dedicated actors in, in New York, we squoze the 40 weeks down to a weekend. And, um, and so I've been teaching this course. I taught the course for 15, 20 years before somebody, you know, before I finally wrote the book, somebody 25 years ago said, you should write a book. And so it only took me a short, short, short 25 years to, <laughs> um, to write the first book. And then what? I wrote the second book, which only took me four or five years. Why did you leave New York? Seems like you were doing fine there. Uh, because, you know, when they call it not-for-profit theater, they're not kidding. That, that's exactly what it is. It's not-for-profit. And we were, we were broke. It was the middle of a, of a recession. It was, they called it Black Tuesday when, when Wall Street just took a dive. And the Arts Council uh, cut our funding by 75%. And there was, you know, wow. we, we couldn't move on. We couldn't keep going. Yeah. So I thought, oh, comedy, uh, finding talented, funny people. Where, where might that skill be useful? So I, I went to Los that. Angeles and um, I had a friend, uh, a college friend who was uh, at HBO at the time. And I pitched them a project and that got going. And then they pitched me another project and we did that. And then, uh, one thing led to another, and uh, I've been going around the world now doing comedy workshops. Well, not actually not now going around the world. Now I'm just sitting at home talking, talking to people on Zoom. I think that's great because a lot more people have access now. They can't. In fact, we're, we're about to start a, um, uh, a, uh, a master class in, in comedy uh the uh comedy intensive online we're starting that october 10th which if you go to my website www.kaplancomedy.com um you can find out all about that i think i posted the link oh well, i posted all oh, of the great. links uh, onto the facebook page so people can find that or, too. or email me at steve at kaplancomedy.com yeah i'm i'm i answer all my emails because i'm lonely and i've been in quarantine for seven months so um, I hope I'm not going to make you blush by asking this question, but aside from your books, what do you think is your greatest contribution to the world of comedy writing? St I stopped being an actor. <laughs> I, think, oh. I think that's probably my great. No, um, I, I think just working with, working and developing, discovering, producing, directing uh, great comic talent over the years. Um, uh, when I, when I um, wrote, wrote the first book, I, I did the, I don't know if any of you out there in Zoom land uh, have written books or tried to get people to write blurbs for your books. It's a daunting and humiliating task. Um, uh, especially people who you thought were friendly of, to you and, 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 you know, don't return your emails. But I, I sent this one email uh, to this guy who we had discovered at the HBO New Writers Project. Um, and he went on to do uh, a couple of projects for HBO. Uh, he did Big Love and then he did, um, he did the one where the people working in the hospice, um, getting, getting Out, I think it was called. And I wrote him this very, you know, I hope you remember me and I wrote this book and can I send you a couple of chapters and could you give me a, and he wrote me back this, this glowing Valentine that said, remember you, you, you gave me my career. What are you talking about? Which, which made my day. Um, 
so I think I think I think that's that's just it. Just um, I've I've worked with a lot of talented people. I've worked with a lot of people who've gone on to success, and um, I'm happy to have been involved in that way. That's I, I thought when I started out that I'd be this great funny character actor, but it turned out I couldn't. I kept on cracking myself up on stage, so I wasn't very good. Um, but I had a facility for directing, a better facility for producing, and a better facility for teaching. And that's what I've done. Well, we definitely need teachers. I think that's probably the most important thing we have right now. <laughs> um, so I'm going to get to your book now, The Hidden Tools of Writing Comedy. It ends where I want to um, start. It's an, okay. a, a question that is eternally burning in the hearts of screenwriters, and you answer it there. So how do we sell our comedy scripts? Uh, with difficulty? <laughs> um, OK, how do you sell your comedy script? I'm, I, 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 I have to say right off the top that I'm not I'm not the go-to guy uh, on on selling stuff. Um, I have a lot of friends who who've written books and, and do that as a living. Um, Michael Haig has written the books "Selling Your Story in 60 Seconds." I guess that's all you really need is just 60 seconds, and, and then you'll sell your story. Um, Jen Grisanti, uh, Kathy Fungineda, uh, they've all kind of. Uh, um, Carol, uh, Carol Kirshner, they've all kind of cornered the market on how you sell, how you sell your story. But I, I can tell you a couple of, a couple of ways. Uh, there, I mean, to, to, to be non, to be not helpful at all. There are two basic ways. Be brilliant and let people know about it. So if you, if you're brilliant and you don't let anybody know about it, nothing's going to happen. If you let people know about it, oh, wrong figure, sorry. Uh, if you let people know about it and you're not brilliant, you might not sell either, although two and a half men would put the lie to that. Uh, but let me tell you, let me tell you a couple of stories about how people were brilliant and, and let people know about it. There, uh, for, for a short time, after HBO uh, decided not to continue the HBO New Writers Project because new, they had new writers, new writers were coming to them. They didn't need to have a whole expensive project to find them. That we started the HBO Workspace and that was to support the, um, the comedy uh, festival in Aspen. And what we did was uh, we had performers come in, um, uh, uh, people doing sketch. Uh, we had uh, Tenacious D, for instance, perform for them, and they, then they booked them in Aspen, and we would do other things. So, so we had this performance space in the middle of Hollywood that uh, when we put on, we put on shows almost every night of the week, uh, and we would get, and HBO executives would come down to see what was going on. So we had this one woman uh, who, uh, she was very funny. She was in the road company touring company of the uh, Toronto Second City. And she had come with her husband to Los Angeles. Her husband immediately got work on TV. He was a recurring actor in a lot of series, but she couldn't get arrested. She couldn't even book a commercial. So she didn't know what to do. She was talented, very funny. So she wrote a screenplay and nobody wanted to read it. Or if they read it, nobody wanted to do anything with it. So she thought, okay, I'm gonna put this on as a one person show. I'm a performer. I went to Second City. I know how to do this. I can play characters. So I'm gonna put on this show. And so she came to us at the workspace and we put it on. Uh, and it was very funny and um, HBO executives came and they loved it and nothing happened. So rather than saying, well, what can I do? She rented a space on Melrose Avenue and performed this show for a year, like every Tuesday night. And she would work hard to get uh, people to come to see the show. And she had a certain niche uh, that she marketed to and people came to the show and she just did it every Tuesday night. And one night, uh, Rita Wilson showed up. Rita Wilson, Tom Hanks' wife, because um, the name of the show was 
my big fat Greek wedding. And Rita Wilson, despite her last name, is Greek. So she came to the show and she, she loved it. And she brought the, less, the rest of Playtone down to see it and they loved it. And it became the highest grossing independent romantic comedy of all time because she was brilliant and she let people know about it. She just didn't have this one screenplay and go, you know, read this, read, you know, she figured out a way, if, if I'm not getting in the door this way, how else can I get in the door? And my second story on how to sell your story is I was doing a workshop for writers in Australia. And there was this one guy uh, who wrote what I thought was a very funny comedy um, on people, on a guy struggling, struggling with Asperger's. And I thought the screenplay was pretty funny. Uh, but he had made a mistake because he had written the screenplay when he, when he was on the wrong side of 50. So nobody would read it because he was on the wrong side of 50. So he's got this funny screenplay and, and you know, uh, all these uh, Screen Australia or Film Victoria or whoever was funding the workshop was thought he was talented. And so what are you supposed to do? So he, so he said, fuck it. I'm going to write it as a novel. So he wrote it as a novel, um, The Rosie Project. It got published by a publisher in Australia, and it got optioned to be developed as a screenplay because he was brilliant, and he just figured out a way to let people know it. We live in a time in which if you're brilliant, there's nobody stopping you from letting people know it. Do a crazy video and upload it to YouTube. Um, do a podcast. There was a guy who had a funny Twitter feed who got a, uh, a sitcom, which they ruined, by the way. But, um, but so, and then there was another guy in Ohio whose Twitter feed was so funny, they hired him on a late night show in New York. So if you're brilliant, and it takes a long time and work to get to be brilliant, if you're brilliant, just figure out a way to let people know about it and, and do it yourself, make it yourself. If you think that your screenplay is so great, film it. You've got, a, you've got a phone, there's a film studio inside your phone, do it. As you know, Wendy, because you did yours on an iPhone, do it, Pro prove everybody else wrong. If you're right and your stuff is great and everybody else is wrong, do it, prove it. That's um, uh, Fleabag was a show at the Edinburgh Fringe Festival. Um, uh, Insecure was a web series. Uh, you know, Broad City was a web series that they started by themselves with no money because they thought they were brilliant and they wanted to let people know about it. Now, um, you tell us story. If you start a web series, is that like 100% sure you're going to be famous? No. Because first you have to be brilliant. You, you tell a story that I, I really loved. Uh, um, and the first thing you said in this interview that I watched is that you need to lose all shame and call people up. And you told a story about how you did that. And I, I'd like you to tell us about that, if that's OK. I don't remember that. You don't remember that. Um, because I, I have not lost all my shame. I, I, ha I still have plenty of shame to go around. I have shame to share with all of you. Um, uh, but, I, but when I came to Los Angeles, I had no job. I was sleeping on my brother's borrowed futon. And what I knew I had to do was I had to simply get in touch with everybody who I had ever known or might have known or stood behind on a line at Starbucks and just start to put myself out to, to say yes to the universe. And so one day I walk into Chris Albrecht's office and I knew Chris Albrecht from, from college. I, we were in the same college at Hofstra University, the same theater program. And I go in there and say, hey, Chris, do you remember me from college? And he says, don't you remember we also went to high school? We went to Cyprus in high school together and I had completely forgotten it because the 60s and the 70s and, and drugs. Um, 
and and that led to my getting a, a gig at HBO, and it led to kind of everything else. So so I guess in that way you have to be shameless, and you also have to realize that if somebody asked you for help, what would you say? Would you say fuck you? No. What what would you say if somebody wrote you an email or wrote you a letter, or called you on the phone, and said can you give me some help? Um, would you, would you say go to hell? No, you'd say, sure, if I can, because you're a good person. So why, why do you think, why do you think that the other person is not a good person? So try them there. I mean, I, I did have some experiences where I asked this one person in the industry, uh, can I pick your brain? And she immediately shot back. I don't like my brain to be picked, okay? And then there was five minutes of, of other stuff that I kind of went, I went into a coma and then she hung up. And so, yeah, okay. So I'm not going to ask you for help because you're not going to give me any help because I don't want to pick your brain. <laughs> you know, maybe somebody picked it before and you're too sensitive about that. But for the most part, um, ask. Now, I get into trouble because my, my living, my, my, my livelihood is working with writers and performers and consulting on scripts with producers and writers. And so, I, I, you know, people say, you said to just ask, so I'm asking, read my script. And then I have to say, yes, but um, that's what you want from me, but here's what I need from you. And oftentimes that's like, that's the deal breaker. But, you know, um, doesn't, doesn't hurt to ask, uh, doesn't mean that somebody's going to say yes, but, um, you know, they certainly can't uh, say you, yes. You, have, you, don't you, ask. Have, you have to let go of your ego. Um, it's hard. It's hard. I've, I've, a you know, I have a friend who, uh, author and, and, uh, he can't take rejection. So he's, he writes a book, he sends out three queries he gets one rejection and he's on he's in a fetal position for the for a month what can you do yeah well um i guess uh, as you were saying if you if you don't ask then nobody can say yes I, and i guess that's right. what you have to look at it. I, I, I guess i guess the um the uh the spiritual side you know the spiritual side says say yes to the universe because you never know who is out there in the universe who's going to give you a helping hand or is you're going to connect with the other thing i say is that if you're the funniest person in the room talking about comedy if you're the funniest person in the room find another room because you can't you shouldn't be the funniest person in the room because it means you're not learning anything go to a different room go to um you know, in New York or LA, UCB or, or Second City or, or go somewhere where people are funnier than you and more talented than, than you so you can learn from them. Okay. So um, speaking of COVID, is there anybody looking for comedy scripts during COVID? Or are more uh, people I mean, looking? I'm, I'm, not, I'm not in that side of the industry, yeah. but, but uh, there... They're desperate for, uh, they're desperate for material, and at the same point, at the same time, they're kind of backed up mm -hmm. because of all the productions that have stopped because of COVID. So it's not like they've got a lot of empty space in in, in their uh, on their channels because um, uh, there are a lot of things that are are slated to go. But on the other hand, they they've lost a lot of projects because of COVID because in order to keep talent attached to projects, they have to pay them. And, and if there, you know, it becomes a, a kind of an economic decision. If they're gonna have to pay everybody, um, uh, there was this one show on Netflix that I loved um, about this girl who was gaining superpowers with puberty. Um, I can't remember the names, maybe somebody can has seen it and can tell me the name in the chat. I'm not okay with this or something like that. 
and it, they said they were going to be renewed and then they just got canceled because they couldn't start production and it was too expensive to keep everybody on payroll um, when they couldn't they couldn't give them product to use so so yes people are people will always need product people will always need uh, need comedies um, it's a little different in in uh, American television in so far as that American television is kind of like uh, the baseball major leagues meaning that you not only have all the players in the major leagues, you have all the players in the minor leagues. People who are on staff are the minor leagues. Um, even the people who are executive producers, if they're not showrunners, that's who they're, that's who the people are looking for um, to pitch them uh, uh, an idea for a new series. So, so in America, for the most part, um, they're not looking for unknowns to pitch them TV series. Although that's changing too with Netflix and Amazon and Apple. But, but it's still better to have something be successful somewhere in a smaller pond because that's what, that's what Hollywood does is it poaches from smaller ponds and brings them to the big pond. Um, so, uh, you know, Schitt's Creek started, you know, as a small CBC production. Um, and until Netflix picked it up, uh, it, it really didn't, um, a lot of people still didn't know about it. But then when Netflix picked it up, then it became the thing and then they won everything. So, so occasionally there will be somebody who will be plucked out of obscurity because of some success they've gotten in some other field. And, um, Fleabag is the best example of that, where uh, she was talented but unknown, and then Fleabag put her on the map, uh, as opposed to some unknown person just coming with a script and saying, "This is going to be great." Most people need to be need to have it proven to be great before they before they believe it. So, um, in one of your interviews, you also said the first thing you need in order to be a brilliant comedy writer is to write a brilliant premise. So what is a brilliant premise? Uh, that's not exactly what I said. Okay. Um, I, I, I get my friend, my friend, Michael Haig wrote this book, how to sell your story in 60 seconds. And in the book, there's a whole chapter on the elevator pitch. You know, uh, you're in an elevator with, with Steven Spielberg and he pushes seven. And so you have until floor seven to pitch him your great idea. Uh, meanwhile, Steven Spielberg is probably wondering where his security is. Um, that, you know, that's your elevator pitch. That's your log line. For me, I, I, I deal in tools that you can use. And for me, a comic premise is a tool that you use to open up the world of your story uh, so that you can, you can imagine it and write it down. Um, you know, we call it the lie that tells the truth. It's, you, it's either something impossible or improbable. And, and we're talking about features as opposed to sitcoms. Um, something impossible or improbable that could never happen or probably could never happen. But if it did happen, what would happen then? So, so the, the better the premise is to you, um, the, the more the story happens in your own imagination. For instance, a guy wakes up, it's the same day every day. Could that ever happen? No. But if it did happen, what would happen then? Now, I use it as an example, not only because Groundhog Day is one of my favorite films of, of all time, but because if you ever get a chance to search the internet and find the original Danny Rubin draft, it's unreadable. Sorry, Danny. It's, it's really not good. Um, uh, Phil Connors is just this nice guy that shit is happening to for about 75 pages. And then 
he gets together with Rita and they figure it out. And it's basically just a nice guy where shit happens to. But the premise was so good that it sold. And it, and it made Harold Ramis say, see, what's the, what is the potential of this, of this idea? And, and Harold Ramis came up with the idea that maybe Phil needs to be a jerk so that, he, so that there's a journey, so that there's an arc, so that something happens to him. Because a comic premise is tied to a theme. The, the, the engine of the story is the impossible thing. But then you tie it to a theme, and theme calls on characters. Um, so, so uh, for instance, um, uh, in Big, uh, the premise of Big is a kid makes a wish on a fortune telling machine and he wakes up the next day and he's a 30 year old man. Could that ever happen? No, I see what you're saying, Theo, and it couldn't. It could never happen, Theo. But if it did happen, what would happen then? Uh, and so, you know, uh, so people are, you know, so you know who's not in Big? Uh, the President of the United States, because it has nothing to do with politics. And you know who else is not in big? Um, his uh, his teacher, because it really doesn't have anything to do with 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 being in middle school. Um, but who's in big? Is his friend, and uh, and his mom, and then the people he works with. So 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 where should he work? I mean, he he's he's dancing on the keys. Uh, in F.E.O. Schwartz, and some guy dances with him, and, and so maybe that guy gives him a job. So my question is, is why couldn't that guy be a guy who owns a gas station? Why couldn't um, Josh start working at a gas station? Because it has nothing to do with the theme of the movie. The theme of Big is what is the confluence, the nexus between childhood and adulthood? How does a gas station explore that um, at all? So it's, you know, so the choice of a, of a toy company is perfect because a toy company is an, is an organization run by adults, supposedly for children, and that gets you right at the nexus of adulthood and childhood. A lot of people think that theme is like a quotation, is like a saying like love conquers all. The theme of Romeo and Juliet is love conquers all. But not really. I mean, because they both die at the end. So how does that conquer all? To me, theme is best expressed as a question. What's the nature of love? And if you look at Romeo and Juliet, you see that, that every character there is some aspect of love. Uh, Romeo's love for his buddies, Mercutio and Benvolio, the nurse's love for Juliet, Romeo's love for Rosalind, the girl he's all emo about in the beginning of the play, which is why his friends are out to get him, you know, to get him to a party to have a good time because he's thinking, I'll never be happy again. This girl dumped me. And that's when he meets Juliet. So it's all about the nature of love. So you take a great premise. Now, could you write a great movie about a boy and a girl sitting on a park bench talking for two hours? Sure, why not? It's just really, really difficult. Um, you take a great premise and you, uh, you marry it to character and theme and you stop si figuring out what funny thing should happen next? And rather ask the question, what would they do next? Every bad comedy you've ever seen is, is powered by the thought of, wouldn't it be funny if? Wouldn't it be funny if I have this character do this? Wouldn't it be funny if this character does that? The best comedies are powered by, given these circumstances and given who this person is, what would they do next? What would they do next? Because the only time you should lie in, in, in a movie is when you tell the lie. 
I'm going to wake up. It's the same day every day. I'm going to make a wish. I'm going to grow. I'm going to be 30 years older. In the producers, the improbable premise is that these two producers, you know, conniving producers are going to pick the world's worst play ever in order to close in one day so that they can get, so that they won't have to return the investment, which they, they can, you know, a thousand times over the budget. Could that happen? Maybe, but probably not, probably not to that extent. So that's an improbable premise. But after that improbable premise, everything is, is, and given the crazy characters, everything is developed organically and honestly from the premise, powered by theme, through character. Uh, an example of a movie that, that, does, that has more than one lie in the movie is the animated movie Chicken Little. In Chicken Little, uh, ch the premise of Chicken Little is Chicken Little is uh, like in middle school. He's an anthropomorphic chicken and he and because he's claimed that the sky is falling, he humiliates himself and his father at a time of life in which a kid would rather die than be humiliated, middle school. And then in the middle of the movie is this, is this climactic baseball game in which he wins the game and thereby not humiliate his father, but that's the middle of the movie because after that there's an alien invasion. Doesn't help the movie. Didn't make it, didn't make it to the, one of the classic animated movies because you only get one chance to tell a lie. And after that, you have to play it honestly and organically. But the comic premise helps you imagine the story. For instance, in my workshops, we do an exercise, we, uh, the comic premise exercise. I ask people to get into groups and come up with a comic premise using some of the, the, some of the tools we talk about. One group came up with this premise. A college football team discovers that the only time that they can win is when they get the nerd laid. The only time that they can win is when they get the nerd laid. Fernanda and Theo are, are laughing at that. Now, here's the thing. That's a terrible idea for a movie. I, I wouldn't want to watch that movie. Uh, I, if I was on a plane, I wouldn't watch that movie. I would want to leave, even if I was on a plane. But here's what's happening. Even in this terrible idea, scenes are already occurring to you. I mean, um, you know, uh, if you, you know, you can unmute yourself and shout. I mean, sh uh, for instance, there's the winning montage. You know, if they're a losing football team, there's the losing montage. Then there's the winning montage. Um, then there's the scene in which the football players try to get the nerd uh, cool so he can pick up a girl. And then all these scenes are happening in your imagination and you don't even like the idea. The better the premise is to you, the more the idea happens in your imagination. And the, and the, and the easier it is to write the story because it's already percolating. Um, Woody Allen used to be my hero. Used to be because, <laughs> yeah. let's admit, he's, he's kind of got a somewhat problematic thing going for him. Um, but Woody Allen um, in American Masters, this documentary, he talks about how he comes up with his, his ideas. And basically this little elfin weird man uh, has all these slips of paper in a drawer. He, he takes them out, he jumps them on the bed, he goes through them, he picks up a piece of paper, and if he can, he looks at the idea, and if he can think about it for about five minutes, he realizes it's not a movie. If he can pick up another piece of paper, and if he can imagine the story for about an hour, he thinks he might have a screenplay. Now, the important thing is he doesn't throw away the piece of paper where he can only think about it for five minutes, because in another day, the ideas will occur to him. So to me, that's what a comic premise is. It's, it's this, I, have, haven't you ever heard of an idea of a movie that you thought, oh my God, I wish I had thought of that. Because 
oh, I know exactly how that should be. And then you watch the movie and you say, well, they've done this completely wrong. <laughs> because they have for you. Um, I, I watched um, Invention of Lying um, uh, by Ricky Gervais. I thought that was a great premise. A guy uh, in, is, it lives in a world in which no one has ever lied before. And he, he for the first time, he lies. Um, now, I don't want to say anything bad about Ricky Gervais because he endorsed my book and I appreciate that for him. Uh, but I thought that in my head, it had to develop out of that. And it kept on, if you've ever seen the movie, it keeps on breaking its own rules. Um, whereas I, I just kept on thinking, if he just stick, stuck with his own rule, a guy who discovers that lying, that he can lie and no one else knows about it, um, would be great. But Ricky Gervais had a point of view he wanted to say something about religion, which is okay. That's his right. But I keep on, I kept on thinking, first figure out what your character would do. I mean, figure out what your character would do. What would happen to your character if that was the one thing that was true? If that's the one lie and then take it from there and see what happens. So, so I, I think that that's what a comic premise is to me. It's, it's, it's a writing tool. It's, it's mm -hmm. the way you, you avoid finding yourself two pages into act two and being completely stumped because it's not about you. It's not up to you. Who are your characters? What do they want? What are they, what will they, what are they capable and willing to do to get what they want? Um, what's stopping them and then follow them as opposed to making shit up. Try not to make shit up. Invention is overrated. Picasso once said that good artists create, but great artists steal. <laughs> so steal, steal from life, steal from people you know, steal from your, your own reality only with this one twist. So um, before we move on to the in the uh, comic hero's journey. Is there any other of the hidden tools that you want to talk about from the first book? Um, yeah, uh, just the, uh, I guess the tool of straight line wavy line, um, in which uh, uh, people think that, that, that comedy is about, uh, you know, like a comic duo. There's a straight man and a, and a, uh, and a comic. And the straight man just kind of gives lines to, uh, to a, um, you know, just set up lines to the comic and the comic says something funny. In reality, comedy, the, the dynamic is somebody struggling with the problem and somebody uh, unable to solve the problem, but still trying to solve the problem, but they can't because they're what we call a non-hero, somebody who lacks some, if not all, the essential skills and tools with which to live. So, um, John Cleese once said that when they started Monty Python, they thought that comedy was watching somebody do something silly. They came to realize that comedy is watching somebody watch somebody do something silly. It's the character who is most like us, struggling in the moment, to try to figure something out without the skills and tools with which to do it, as opposed to just, you know, the, just saying, saying and doing funny things without the dynamic of somebody being like us and somebody being maybe crazy or blind to the problem or creating the problem and that we're having to deal with it. We like to say that you can't have Mork without Mindy. You can't just have craziness. You need somebody to ground it. And that person who's grounding it isn't the straight man. He's not, he's not the boring guy. He's the human being struggling in that moment, trying to figure out what the fuck is going on. Um, I, 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 can, I can show this to you in a, in a second. Let me, let me try to share. 
Let me hold on one second. Let me. Um, uh, I'm going to try to. I'm looking for this. Ah, there we go. I love. It. Okay, so let me let me sh let me share my screen. Will you stand still? Pick up your hat. Don't pick up your hat. Okay. Now look. Then you'll go and peddle your popcorn and don't interrupt the act anymore. Yes, sir. All right. But you know, strange may seem they give ball players nowadays very peculiar names. Funny names? Nicknames. Pet not, names. Not as funny as my name, Sebastian Dinwiddie. Oh, oh yes, yes, yes. Funny ain't Oh, absolutely. Yes. yes. Now, on the St. Louis team, we have uh, who's on first, what's on second. I don't know who's on third. That's what I want to no. find out. I want you to tell me the names of the fellas on the St. Louis I'm, team. I'm telling you, who's on first, what's on second. I don't know who's on third. Do you know the fellas' names? Yes. Well, then who's playing first? Yes. I mean, the fellas' name on first base. Who? The fellow playing first base for St. Louis. Who? The guy on first base. Who is on first? Well, what are you asking me for? I'm not asking you. I'm telling you who is on first. I'm asking you who's on first. That's the man's name. That's whose name? Yeah. Well, go ahead and tell me. Who? The guy on first. Who? The first base. Who is on first? Have you got a first base when I'm first? Certainly. Then who's playing first? Absolutely. When you pay off the first base for every month, who gets the money? Every dollar of it. Why not? The man's entitled to it. Who is? Yes. So who gets it? Why shouldn't he? Sometimes his wife comes down and collects it. Who's wife? Yes. Okay, so let's take a look at these two guys, okay? Uh, one of them is blind to the problem, and one of them is struggling with the problem. Now, sometimes people say that Bud Abbott, the tall guy in the St. Louis Wolves uniform, he's the one who's struggling with the problem. But he's not, because if somebody says, um, uh, for instance, um, uh, Theo, unmute yourself. And just ask me, uh, who's on first? Who's on first? Oh, absolutely. <laughs> oh, oh, I see. You see, I see you're confused. No, no, it's, it's a guy named Jimmy Who. And Sam what? He's on second base. You see, if Abbott really saw what was happening, he would correct Costello. But Abbott is blind to the problem. Costello, on the other hand, is struggling with the problem. But because he's a non-hero, he can't solve it. But I know that Abbott... I know that Costello, the short fat guy, sees because he's about to learn about third base. After all, the man earns it. Who does? Absolutely. Well, what I'm trying to find out is what's the guy's name on first base? Oh, no, no. It's... What is on second base? I'm not asking you who's on second. Who's on first? That's what I'm trying to find out. Well, don't change the players. I'm not it. changing nobody. Take it easy. What's the guy's name on first base? What's the guy's name on second base? I'm not asking you who's on second. Who's on first? I don't know. He's on first. We're not talking about him. How did I get on third base? You mentioned his name. If I mentioned a third base was named, who did I say is playing third? No, who's playing first? Stay off of first, will you? Well, what do you want me to do? Now, what's the guy's name on third base? Well, what's on second? I'm not asking you who's on second. Who's on first? I don't know. He's on third. There I go, back on third again. Well, I can't change their names. Will you please stay on third base, Mr. Now, what is it you want to know? What is the fella's name on third base? What is the fella's name on second base? I'm not asking you who's on second. Who's on first? I don't know. Third base. So you see, he's, he's learned. He doesn't quite know why, but he's learned about third base. Now, here's the thing. The, the wavy line, as we call it, the person who's struggling, isn't, isn't a, a function of character. It's a function of focus. Because right now, between the two of them, who do you care about? Do you care about Costello's or do you care about Abbott? Do you care about the short fat guy or do you care about the tall skinny guy? I would have to say, most of you would have to say, well, I care about the short fat guy. He seems to be having a problem. The wavy line commands our emotional attention. He's got the emotional focus. Now that can switch. 
not only from scene to scene, but from moment to moment within a scene. It's who's got the focus. Who do we care about? Uh, let, let me sh let me show you um, another clip. Fire drill. You believe that? Who's Pericles? Pericles is correct. Like fire in a school, such a big deal. <laughs> you got any matches? Middle drawer. Was Sir Arthur Conan Doyle. You're looking for who is Sir Arthur Conan Doyle. Thanks. Hello. Jerry. Oh, hi, Kitty. I heard what happened to the junior high. They can't bump you like that. That is so unprofessional. Oh, relax, Katie. It's not a problem. It is borax. Yes, you're right. They bump you in junior high. The next thing you know, you're being bumped in high schools, colleges, trade schools. Before you know it, Letterman's not returning your calls. <laughs> ashtray. No, I don't have any ashtrays. Cereal bowls. Jerry, now don't freak out. I'll no, Katie, don't. All right, thanks. What is tungsten or wolfram? We're looking for what is tungsten or wolfram. <laughs> Thank you for answer. The other day, is this a repeat? No, no, no. Just lately, I've been thinking a lot clearer. You know, like this afternoon, I was chicken Kiev. I really enjoyed watching it. Okay, so here's the thing. George is blind. Does George see that he's now become a genius? No, but Jerry does. He can't quite figure it out. Jerry's the, Jerry is the wavy line. Jerry is, he's looking back and forth. Kramer keeps running up and uh, running in and out, asking for ashtrays. And the one thing that's really uh, vital for writers to know is it means that those characters, when they're in focus like that, you don't need to write clever dialogue for them because they're basically spending their time going, what, huh? As opposed to being clever. So I just want to show you one more clip. Okay. I don't know, Tom. I don't feel good. I feel nervous. I really feel nervous. Oh, come on. Relax. Relax. You been to the cash machine? Yeah. Car clean? Mm -hmm. Plenty of gas? Uh -huh. mm. Breath. How's your breath? It's fine. It's melt All right. Well, I think you're all set. So just go uh, clean the pipes once you go. <clears throat> huh? You know, clean the pipes. What do you mean, clean the pipes? You choke the chicken before any big date, don't you? Tell me you spank the monkey before any big date. Oh my God, he doesn't flog the dolphin before a big date. Are you crazy? That's like going out there with a loaded gun. Of course that's why you're nervous. Oh my dear friend, please sit, please. Oh, look, um, after you've had sex with a girl and you're lying in bed with her, are you nervous? No, no, you're not. Why? Because I'm tired. Eh, wrong. It's because you ain't got the baby batter in the brain anymore. Jesus, that stuff will fuck your head up. <laughs> oh, look, the most honest moment in a man's life are the few minutes after he's blown his load. Now, that is a medical fact. And the reason for it is that you're no longer trying to get laid. You're actually, you're thinking like a girl. And girls love that. So. Look at all the funny dialogue that they did not write for Ben Stiller. Ben Stiller doesn't go, what are, what are you talking about monkeys? I don't have a, dog, a dolphin to flog. All the witty comebacks, they're not, they're not necessary because the only person who wants to show that they're witty is you, the writer. What the character wants to do is figure out what his crazy friend is talking about. So, so most of the times, your, car your, your protagonist, when they're in focus, their dialogue should be um, simple, direct, and honest. If you watch Groundhog Day, what you'll notice is that 90% of all the quote-unquote jokes in the, in the, uh, in the movie are, are simply Phil Connors telling the truth as he sees it. You know, she says, uh, the Rita says, um, 
you know, I studied 18th century French literature at their, on one of their dates, and he said, what a waste of time. Now, now, what a waste of time isn't the funniest, wittiest joke in the world, but it was just his immediate reaction. But then, they come, but then again, they come back, and, and she says, I studied 18th century French literature, and, he, and then he says, um, and he says this French poem, because he had a couple of days to study French. So straight line, wavy line is the idea that not only uh, is somebody struggling with a problem, but you don't have to write witty dialogue for your, for your main character. Your main character can just be simple, honest, and direct, and, and in dealing with all the crazy characters around him. One of my friends, Steve Scrovan, was one of the executive producers on Everybody Loves Raymond. And he would talk about the fact that they would do a table read and Raymond, because he was also an executive producer, would come up to the writer's room and he would start taking jokes away because he didn't need to do jokes. He could do a reaction. He could do a look or he could just say, what? Because jokes are overrated. Inventions overrated, and jokes are overrated. Click the Show More button in the description panel below and follow the link to Steve's website to learn more about his comedy intensive workshop and his books. You'll also find information on his consulting, screenplay analysis, and coaching services at kaplancomedy.com. Join the Global Film Industry Cafe on Facebook. This growing community of film and television professionals from around the world meets online to share ideas, discuss screenwriting, film and television, and keep each other accountable on our storytelling journey. We encourage, motivate, and inspire each other. Come join us.